Uh, my name is Lynn Nygaard. I'm the director of the Center for Mind, Brain, and Culture. And we are talking today with Arbor Tissimi, who is going to an incoming assistant professor in the psychology department and does interdisciplinary research that um, I hope he will integrate with the um, center um, programming. And uh, Arbor, welcome to Emory. Thanks, Lynn. Uh, and, um, I thought I, we, we could start by just um, telling us a little bit about where you come from, what your um, sort of trajectory was coming to Emory, and then we'll talk a little bit about your research. Yeah, totally. And thanks so much for giving me this opportunity to connect with the Center for Mind, Brain, and Culture. I'm really excited to learn more about it as I transition to Emory. So I am from Waterbury, Connecticut. I was born and raised there. I'm actually currently in Waterbury, where I <laughs> Yeah. quarantining with my parents and my sister. I uh, was raised in a very Albanian household. My parents are Albanian immigrants who uh, have owned a restaurant my entire life, which I've been very fortunate to be a part of and work at throughout my schooling. I um, never saw myself as becoming a psychologist. In fact, I always thought that psychology was sort of the weird major that you couldn't really do much with. Um, but then I took an intro psych class and I was completely mesmerized. I thought, whoa, I can have a career studying a problem that I find really fascinating and hopefully relevant to most folks and make a living out of that. But then the issue became, well, what should that problem be? So I spent a lot of my years in college sort of going from lab to lab, trying to identify what that question or what that research area might be. And it just so happened that my situation led me to what I'm doing today. So I spent most summers in college working at my parents' restaurant. It's just what I did and had to do to help afford to pay for college. And I knew that I wanted research experience. And I figured, well, let me check out what research opportunities are available at Yale, which was the institution that's closest to my family home and also my parents' restaurant. Mm -hmm. And I think it was February or March, and most internship applications had closed. But one lab happened to have an opening, and that was the Yale Baby Lab. And at that po point, I really knew very little about research and infant cognition. And to be perfectly honest, babies kind of freaked me out at that point. Mm -hmm. But I realized, well, it's still a research opportunity. Nevertheless, let me wet my feet. So I sent an email, uh, the stars aligned, and I spent my summer there. And I was blown away. The right. fact that I and others can develop really simple and clever methods to try to tap into the foundations of how we think, to me, was a really, really cool opportunity. And I was really fortunate that I got to develop that interest um, towards the end of my college career and then to return to the Yale Baby Lab as a graduate student. So I graduated from the University of Pennsylvania in 2011 and then started my PhD at Yale um, that same year in the fall. And I kind of had um, an interesting graduate school experience. So my first year, uh, on my walk back to my apartment, I was beaten and knifed by a gang. Mm -hmm. And I spent most of my first year recovering from that. I had to have two surgeries. And I bring that up because we're living in a really difficult and unusual time where a lot of our life goals and plans and interests are upended by a pandemic, a racial reckoning, and everything else that's going on in the world. And I think one of the most important lessons that I've learned on my trajectory is that academia, like most domains, is a community. And I've been very, very fortunate to have people um, support my interests, uh, allow me to develop them, and really get me through the tough times. And I think that's an important lesson for all of us to keep in mind as we navigate this really difficult space that we're not in this alone and we have others to help us through the way. So that tangent aside, I, I completed my PhD at Yale, uh, did a postdoc at Stanford, which I'm completing in 16 days and joining Emory's faculty on August 1st. <laughs> Right. Well, that's that, and that's quite a, a kind of a geographical span. And um, uh, thank you for sharing some of the sort of 
reasons why you might be interested in the particular things that you're interested in and also how sort of the sociology or the um, social aspects of the community both in and outside of academia is supportive or you know we, we, we can think of academia as being outside of life <laughs> in some ways right and, and really often it's portrayed that yeah I mean it's sort of the ivory tower but um, it's um, important to remember that we're studying behaviors or we're interested in questions that should be relevant more are, and are relevant more widely. Yeah, Great. so. Um, so you're coming to Emory and tell us a little bit about sort of the research that you've done, sort of your, your intellectual trajectory, right? So the research that you've been doing before you're coming to Emory and what you plan to do. And I know these are early days. You haven't even made it to Emory yet, right? Um, but um, what, what sorts of questions are you interested in pursuing once you get here? Yeah, at the broadest level, I'm interested in this question of where does moral decision making come from? How does it unfold and how does it change over the life course? So to tackle that question, I do research with babies, children, and also adults. But I'm particularly interested in moral decision-making from the perspective of moral conflict. So how do we adjudicate um, dilemmas that pit our desire for personal benefits on the one hand and our interest in the welfare of others on the other hand. Mm -hmm. And a lot of the empirical work that I've done has tried to tackle this problem using a number of designs to see when and why. Um, mm -hmm. I think the why is uh, the million dollar question that I right. hope to uh, tackle at Emory. Why yeah. is it that we do these things? That is prioritize morality over our self-interest in some cases, but not others. So where do you think, um, you know, you're using, you're sort of looking at the de developmental time course and maybe the real time course of these kinds of decisions. Um, so what, I, I had two categories of questions. One is what is moral or mm -hmm. a moral decision making? I mean, in the, in sort of in your research domains or how are you defining that? And then um, what are the possibilities for why or where it comes from? Yeah, totally. Um, so the way that folks in my domain typically, I guess, convey morality to a, mm -hmm. a very young participant is through a morality play. So mm -hmm. an example of a morality play is a character is struggling to open up a clear box that has a toy inside. Yeah. And after several failed attempts, they see two new characters do two different things. One will approach the box and open it up. Another one will come along and slam it shut. So if you were to watch this interaction, you'd say, well, the box opener is nice, the box closer is kind of a jerk. So in this particular context, um, really the contrast is between helping and hindering. And that may map onto morality in the sense of someone who is good in the sense of increasing the welfare of others, so to speak, whereas someone is bad because they're thwarting their goals, harming them, hindering them, et cetera, et cetera. Right. So, so that's sort of the, the go-to method that I and others have used with, right. with very young babies. But of course, that can be elaborated upon once you're studying a verbal population and want to get into more nuances pertaining to morality. But right. to address your second question about where exactly this comes from, that to me is the, the question that I would like to spend the next few years trying to tackle. Right. So the lab where I trained as a graduate student was one of the first, uh, actually the first, if I'm not mistaken, labs to report evidence of this early sensitivity to morality, if we even want to call mm -hmm. it that. So right. the way that they did that, th this is work by, uh, led by Kylie Hamlin, who uh, at the time was a graduate student and is now faculty at the University of British Columbia, along with Karen Wynn and Paul Bloom, um, showed babies uh, another morality play. And this morality play involved a character that was struggling to climb a hill. Right. And, and they tried and tried and couldn't seem to get up that hill. And then they saw a character push them up or a character push them down. Right. If you present a baby at six months between those two characters, the choice between those two characters, they'll consistently reach for the nice character over the mean character. And that initial piece of evidence was supported by a number of subsequent studies which basically yielded the same pattern of findings, which led them and others to consider, well, 
how is it that babies are doing this? You know, when you think of a six month old, for example, particularly in these very novel situations that involve new characters, new interactions that they presumably have never been exposed to in their lives, how is it that they're generating these systematic responses? Mm -hmm. And the perspective, a theoretical perspective that has gained a lot of traction and is quite popular in developmental psychology today is that maybe these tendencies reflect core or innate knowledge uh, in the service of survival. A, a lot of this is contextualized from the perspective of evolutionary psychology. So if a baby can identify who is a good person out in the world versus a bad person out in the world, then that could uh, help them out because right. of course you want to affiliate with good people and avoid bad people. Right, right. Um, throughout graduate school, I obviously was sort of trained in that perspective. <laughs> right. Um, you know, th th that, that was the Kool-Aid that I drank. But as the years went by, I found myself wondering, well, what are the data that are needed to really drive home that conclusion? So I spent my years at Stanford um, trying to develop such tests and in the process of doing so, arrived at a different framework that resulted in my departure from, I guess, my academic home. So I recently published- You're uh, augmenting. You're, aug you're augmenting. Yes, yes. Right, you're, 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 you're taking those ideas and moving forward with them. So I, not departure, right, or, yeah. Yeah, I'm, I'm augmenting them, yeah. I, yeah. I, guess, I guess I'm <laughs> departing in the sense that, yeah, uh, yeah I, um, I'm leaving the nest. I'm leaving yes, the nest. Very, right, right, right. right. Um, so in the process of really trying to make sense of the findings that exist, I also decided to um, listen to a lesson that I think was imparted on me in my first day of graduate school, which is a lesson that I think more and more young scientists, I hope, uh, are sensitive to, and that is it's difficult enough to stay abreast with all of the science that goes on in the world. I mean, there's so many journals, there's so many different findings, and it's hard enough to keep up with you know, right. what is the current status of X, X being any particular phenomenon? Um, and I think the problem is that a lot of us aren't reading old and classic findings. Right. So, yes, we have made major shifts in how we study our problems, how we conceptualize these problems, how we interpret these problems. Right. But these are age-old problems. So there's something to be said about trying to understand how we as a field have conceived of them and, and, and how that's changed. So um, in trying to make sense of these findings um, that are suggesting that babies have this early moral sensitivity, I decided to spend a lot of time reading classic work in attachment mm -hmm. and um, in right. work in clinical psychology. And that uh, led me to a different picture. And that picture is that well, maybe it's not that babies come into this world with very basic concepts of good and bad, but rather babies come into the world with tools to construct those concepts quite quickly on the basis right. of the relationships that they're building with their caregivers. Right, right. So, um, so um, by attachment, you're referring to this kind of suite of theories or this idea that... Um, infants come into the world and have a primary relationship with a caregiver, right? Exactly. And that primary relationship can be organized or positive. Is that true? Is that, am I characterizing that correctly? Yeah, I think attachment theorists would highlight a number of different factors that right. would result in a baby either being securely or insecurely attached, right? Yeah. Um, but I think one of the measures, or I guess, indices that people often say is a predictor of what a baby will become is the quality of caregiving that they receive from their caregiver. That is, right. is this care, does this caregiver right. tend to respond in a positive and supportive manner? To right. Right. And, Contingent, uh, responding, exactly. right? Yeah. 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 Um, and when you think of the context of the studies that I previously described to you, uh, the nice and the mean characters. Well, what's going on? One character is positively responsive, that is right. facilitating the accomplishment of this goal, whereas the other is hindering this goal. Yeah. 
And if we think of most of the babies that are participating in these studies, I mean, at least when I think back on the babies that typically frequented the baby mm -hmm. lab at Yale, most of them come from supportive, educated, middle-class households that right. reflect a certain population. Right. And uh, I think, you know, many questions arise when considering, well, would there be any differences between babies of similar ages who come from very different households where their right. caregivers aren't supportive? Um, right. Yeah. Are you... Um, um, are you going to pursue those kinds of questions? Yes. Do you think at yeah. yes. <laughs> Emory? Yeah. 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 So, so one of the things that I love about Emory is we have a very rich and generative clinical area. Uh, yeah. We mm -hmm. have folks like Cheryl Goodman and Patty Brennan who mm -hmm. study the quality and nature of these uh, right. parent-child uh, relationships, and I think they have tons of resources and uh, experience that I would definitely love to pick their brains on. Uh, well, well, I can't wait for you to get here. Um, I did have a, I was wondering if there are, I had two additional questions <laughs> that I will leave you alone, but one was um, the extent to which sort of this idea of um, behavioral variation or variation depending on sort of early experience, whether there's, the, whether there are sort of interdisciplinary connections that you've sort of identified and might want to pursue as well. You know? Yeah, totally. Um, so I've only really focused on some aspects of my research program, um, mainly my work with babies, but as I think I alluded to earlier, I've done yeah. research with, you know, kids and adults as well. And in, in thinking of those findings, um, I oftentimes read a lot of sociology and anthropology. Mm -hmm. And I think an anthropological uh, perspective would be really, really useful in the context of the question that you ask. Um, yeah. What gives rise to this behavioral variation and how much of that is bound to the particular cultural context that we're investigating? Right. So right. Um, the fact that the uh, CMBC has these deep connections with departments like anthropology mm -hmm. and sociology right. to, uh, I think just provides a really, really nice platform to uh, you know, put different minds together and <laughs> from each other. Right, right. Um, and I did wanna just mention and um, sort of highlight this recent publication that you've already have with a, another, uh, another uh, researcher here at um, Emory, Stella Larenko, talking about sort of um, you know, if you're interested in these ideas of sort of variation across, you know, different circumstances and maybe across different cultures, um, sort of the kinds of subjects that you recruit <laughs> and the circumstances under which you can recruit them. So um, you and Stella uh, um, published a paper in uh, Trends in Cognitive Sciences, is that right? Um, you know, sort of addressing this issue of what what we generalization of findings, how we recruit our our subject pools, and and what it means to go online in these these days, right? Yeah, totally. So, uh, just to give um, anyone sort of a heads up as to what are the key points that we were trying to address in that short mm -hmm. piece. Um, when the pandemic um, happened, a lot of us were forced to close our labs. And then the question that came up was, well, how can we collect data? So a number of folks have already, I mean, for years have been collecting their data on platforms like Amazon, Mechan right. Amazon Mechanical Turk and uh, other online data collection platforms. And developmental psychologists had been doing that, um, but they really ramped up that process once the pandemic right. was the thing. And one thing that Stella and I uh, just started wondering about is, well, who is participating in these uh, experiments and who are we leaving out? I think the thing that really struck me was um, at the time that Stella and I were thinking about this, um, more and more schools were going online. And as I mentioned, I'm from Waterbury. And Waterbury had, I think, upwards of 30 to 40% of students who did, don't have internet access. Yes. Uh, and they couldn't even do their homework assignments, let alone participate in <laughs> Right, right. And then the question that we asked was, well, okay, uh, some developmental psychologists see their job, or at least their research programs, 
is trying to illuminate foundations of thinking that would presumably be evident in any and all children. Right. And then to arrive at such a conclusion, you ideally would have tested kids from all sorts of backgrounds. Right. Um, so this piece is really trying to bring to light the issue of who is potentially missing from these opportunities. Right. And how can we mitigate that, that, that yeah. problem, right? Uh, wh wh yeah. What alternative options do we have? Or creative yeah. solutions can we devise to right. include them in the process? Yeah, I, I, um, I appreciated the piece because it both identified a problem um, that's, that is, is um, a problem with online data collection, but maybe a, a data collection more generally. And then you and Stella provided several solutions. And so I appreciated not only identifying the problem, but coming up with solutions as well. I will say there was one solution toward the end that I've been spending a lot of time trying to develop and mm -hmm. see if I can actually execute, and that is a mobile baby lab. So there actually yeah. are some universities that have these mobile baby labs. Yeah. And I think pandemic or not, I think more and more of us need to think a bit more about how we can integrate ourselves and our research programs into the community because right. the basic methods and questions of science are and should be accessible to anyone and everyone. Yeah. And I yeah, think yeah. having such uh, data collection methods can can do a lot for us and make, right. make our science better in, in a number of right. ways. Right, right. Um, that's fantastic. So I'm looking forward to that as well. <laughs> our, you, Arbor driving around Atlanta <laughs> in his baby, Bobo baby lab. Um, Although the question is, what, what should we paint the, the, the mobile lab? It needs to be a cool color. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And maybe like a little baby eagle. Okay, I'm just, right, you know, <laughs> sorry. Um, Emory Eagles, right. Um, so Arbor, you have some work that, that looks at this phenomena of dirty money. And so this may be a connection to sort of other disciplinary work. So um, could you describe that a bit? Yeah, totally. So last year, I think, was a really, really interesting time when we think of this issue of dirty money. So I think it was around early May that the president of the Metropolitan Museum of Art announced that they would no longer be accepting money from the Sacklers. So the Sacklers are the family that own Purdue Pharma, which is the pharmaceutical company that produces Oxycontin and other opioids. And we are all very much aware of the fact that there is an opioid epidemic in this country. I think on average over 100 Americans per day overdose and die as a result of mm -hmm. opioids. And what the Met uh, president said at that moment was what more and more museums and institutions around the country and even around the world said, and that is, we can't accept their money because their money's tainted. Right. And weeks later, we saw a similar issue that arose with respect to Jeffrey Epstein and the money that yeah. he gave to uh, various institutions like MIT and Harvard. Right. And what was really fascinating was to see the two different sort of perspectives that emerged, right? Mm -hmm. On the one hand, a number of folks saying that you can't take this money, it's bad. Whereas right. other folks were saying, well, it's money, money's money, all that matters is its value, not what it looks like or where it's been. And I've spent the past few years really trying to understand the psychology behind dirty money. That is, what are the factors that people really care about when it comes to arriving at this conclusion that a dollar is tainted? And then ultimately, what is giving rise to these individual differences? So right. to give you a, a quick sort of overview of the experimental tasks that we use here, I'm gonna run you in a quick experiment, then, if you don't Oh, mind. geez, okay. okay. So say um, I introduce you to a person by the name of Paul, and Paul stole a dollar from another person. The dollar that he stole is in his pocket. Paul has another dollar that he didn't steal in his desk. Paul says you can have the dollar in his desk if you want. So say I ask you, well, how much do you want this dollar on a scale of one to seven? Seven corresponding to a lot, one corresponding to not at all. What would you say? The desk dollar? The desk dollar. The desk dollar, um, six. Okay. Yeah. Um, 
Now I'll tell you about a person by the name of Frank. So Frank found a stolen dollar in his desk and he says, you can have this dollar if you want. How much do you want this dollar? Um, oh gosh. Uh, uh, okay, I think I misnumbered the last one. So is the desk dollar the stolen dollar? In the first the desk case. dollar in the initial case, the first case was not stolen. No. Was not stolen. But now this is a found stolen dollar. Stolen dollar two. Two. Okay. So what was the basic contrast here? In the first case, you were being offered non-stolen money mm -hmm. by a bad person mm -hmm. versus a case where here's a perfectly neutral okay person that's offering you bad money. So right. this is really pitting uh, the morality of the giver against the morality of the money. And what's right. actually really striking about the first case that I gave to you is I stipulated that the person who is giving you the non-stolen dollar happened to steal a different dollar. So when you right, think right. of you know, how money actually functions, it right. doesn't matter what dollar he's giving you, right? A dollar yeah. is a dollar. There's still a stolen dollar involved, right? There's yeah. still a stolen dollar involved, right? Um, and, and he's responsible for the stealing. And he's responsible for the stealing, whereas in the other right. case, someone who just happened to find this stolen piece of currency. And what we find over and over again, and this is work done in collaboration with Susan Gelman at the University of Michigan, um, is that young and old alike, so we've tested children uh, five to nine years of age and a number of studies with adults, they don't want money that itself was stolen. That is, they care uh, about the history of the money, where it came from, more mm -hmm. than the person who's offering them the money. So, <laughs> yeah. and, and a number of yeah. legal theorists have commented on this issue with respect to what types of money should institutions like universities right. accept. I think Lawrence Lessig is the person that's coming to mind right now. So what he argues, and I think others argue as well, is if the money um, was acquired in a way that resulted in others being harmed, e.g. in the case of the Sacklers, then that's the kind of money that we should reject. But right. if the money was earned in a kosher way, but it happens okay. to come from a bad person, that kind of makes the problem a bit more complex and unclear because it's not right. as though the money itself is bad, it's just that the person right. who's offering it is bad. Right. Nevertheless, tainted money or not aside, I think where this becomes really, really interesting from an interdisciplinary perspective is how is it that we reason about um, gifts, right? And I think there's, there's a whole literature in anthropology and sociology that is looking at what are the debts, for example, that are introduced when I accept a gift, right? In what ways am I indebted to you? Right. What does the acceptance versus the rejection signal? I think there are tons of interesting problems that surround right. this pretty ordinary act. Right, right. Really interesting. Really, really interesting. Um, thank you so much for um, taking this time. I know that these are, time is stretched in funny ways with this um, online and virtual environment. And uh, we are really excited about having you join both the psychology department, but also the community, the interdisciplinary community at um, Emory. And um, good luck with the move. <laughs> and uh, we will see you um, this fall. Thanks. Well, yeah. thanks for having me, and I look forward to being a part of the community. Yep. Thank you.